So this was initiated last year. The um, Now it has an official title, the Betty J. Graham Leadership Award for Enhancing Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility in the Genomic Workplace, Workforce, excuse me. Okay, uh, so good afternoon. So for those who are just tuning in on Zoom or after the fact, uh, my name is Lucia Hindorf. I'm a program director in the Training, Diversity, and Health Equity, or TIDE office. I'm honored to kick off this presentation of the 2023 National Human Genome Research Institute's Betty J. Graham Leadership Awards for Enhancing Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility in the Genomics Workforce. To give a little history of the awards program, NHGRI started this program in 2022. We wanted to recognize notable individuals in our field with honorary awards to highlight leadership and accomplishments in diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the human genetics and genomics workforce. The awarded individuals and many more who were nominated have been instrumental in the creation of opportunities for individuals to be part of the genomics workforce. There is also a recognition by these leaders of diverse background perspectives from all backgrounds, especially backgrounds that are underrepresented in biomedical research and how they contribute to improving genomic research. Finally, the awards were designed to recognize sustained and substantial contributions as appropriate for the awardee's career stage. Our hope is that by recognizing the significant contributions of these individuals through the awards, either on a local, national, or even global scale, we can all learn from them how to do better in enhancing diversity of the genomics workforce. In 2022, we were pleased to honor three individuals, an extramural established investigator, Dr. Pardis Sebedi from Harvard University, Dr. Betty Graham, then director of the Division of Extramural Operations at NHGRI, and Dr. Ann McCartney, a then postdoc at NHGRI. In 2023, there were three award categories for the awards program. An extramural early stage investigator who had completed their terminal degree within the past 10 years and has not received a substantial NIH independent research award. An extramural established investigator and recognizing the significant contribution of NHGRI staff uh, can make in this space an NHGRI staff member. In September 2023, the award was named after our dear colleague, Dr. Betty Graham, who was instrumental in cre the creation and nurturing of NHGRI's suite of extramural training programs. She has promoted diversity in NHGRI and NHGRI-funded programs, and her legacy has spread beyond the walls of NHGRI, well beyond the walls, where she is recognized for her passion for mentoring people, even people at the highest levels of the NIH staff. Dr. Graham is here with us today, and I'd like to recognize her for all that she's done. So if Betty, you wouldn't mind standing up. And the floor. Okay, and with that background, I'm happy to turn this over to Dr. Eric Green, the NHGRI Director, to announce the 2023 Betty J. Graham Leadership Awards for Enhancing Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Accessibility in the Genomics Workforce. Eric. Thank you, Lucia. Betty, it's great to see you. You always smile, but there's something about retirement that you're smiling a little wider. I don't know what it is. That's because I'm sleeping longer. You're sleeping longer. Let, let that be a message for all of us. In any case, great to see you. Welcome, for, and thank you for joining us. Um, I should point out that even before I announce the 2023 awardees, I want to say how much that renaming the award in honor of Betty Graham, how much that's meant to the genomics community. Uh, we've received numerous emails of support for renaming the award. We also this year received a record number of nominations. And so I can tell you, as you might imagine, this made our decision to honor just one nominee in each category very difficult, but that's a good thing. And so we look forward to this uh, uh, long-term future for this award each year. So we're also especially proud of this year's awardees for their accomplishments. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to announce each of the awardees one by one, and then each is going to give a 10-minute uh, presentation or so. And then when each of those three presentations have taken place, and we've, um, I'm going to lead a panel discussion. But I also will welcome uh, members of council and of our staff to ask questions of the honorees as well. 
Um, and so that's why we want the honorees to stick around. We have one joining by Zoom, two here in person. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So our first awardee is the Early Stage Extramural Investigator Awardee. It's Shilpa Garg. Um, she's a senior researcher at the Nova Nordisk Foundation Center for Biosustainability in Denmark. Her lab focuses on genomic research that's um, oriented to looking at cancer and fungal studies for sustainability and personalized medicine. She has mentored scientists from diverse backgrounds, creating courses, workshops, internships, and scholarships for underrepresented groups in genomics and advocating for inclusive research. Her involvement with digital platforms like the ERGA sequencing and assembly meeting amplify minority scientists' voice, voices. She is dedicated to being a leader for a more diverse and inclusive future in scientific research and beyond. So Dr. Hara, congratulations. So how do we want a good picture? We're going to want Okay, here, you come, it's heavy. I'm warning you, I'm telling you, it's heavy. Okay. Hello everyone, thanks very much for this recognition and I'm very grateful for that. So today I'm gonna present some of my DEI activities in the era of chromosome scale haplotype result pan genomics. So as we have heard through the day that there is a huge genomic diversity across populations and it could be due to multiple factors like reproduction, migration, and the random fluctuations. And this is actually one of the leading causes of diseases and there have been some nationwide efforts like in US, Africa, in some countries in Europe, and in Asia. But we, what we truly need is a global effort that can recognize the genomic diversity. And also, equity is important in diversity and representation on genetic research studies. And there is a need for inclusivity of a broad of populations to ensure that findings are applicable across races, ethnicities, and geographical regions. So to address some of these issues, um, I have, over the past few years, I've started, initiated this research on allele-specific biology, which is haplotyping. So as we know, humans are deployed, so there exists two homologous copies of each chromosome. And imagine, we know, we know the genotypes here, which is ATE and CT, but actually what we want is the true haplotypes, which means A is connected to T and T is connected to C. And the process of obtaining these haplotypes is known as phasing, and it's very important to study the human migration, population structures, and also to understand the causes of diseases. And with the advancements in genomic sequencing technologies, such as long reads, and especially the lovely hi-fi sequencing technologies, where we can get very long reads and also accuracy with about 99% of accuracy. And then we have high c technology, which actually captures the spatial chromosome confirmation and can give us more long-range information on the genomes. So now the question is, how can we leverage these genomic technologies and new data types to produce these deployed assemblies and get, can get complete genomes? So to answer this, I, with my team, for the first time, combined Hi-Fi and Hi-C in an integrative manner and also very efficient, like we can assemble deployed genomes now within a day and on the chromosome scale level. And then we benchmark these methods on public genomes like HC002 and also quite diverse ancestries we have applied these tools. And we can now produce three gigabases of each haplotype, which is typically was a consensus 
of two haplotypes. Next, I got excited to go beyond diploid genomes, for example, going into personalized genomics like rare diseases, cancer genomes. And as we know, cancer is a highly heterogeneous disease within, within the same tumor across geographical locations and also different tissues. So here I have developed a new graph-based algorithm that can integratively combine HIFI and HICE data and also producing very haplotype structure variations in the dark regions. For example, we can now find structure variations at the base level resolution in ALUS, lines, and sign elements. And we see that our tool, which is PS tools, is also highly consistent with the single cell uh, technology. Next, we have applied our methods to clinically relevant regions like HLA, and we know that it is a highly polymorphic gene, and it's, it's quite unique in every genome, and has high associations to autoimmune and psychiatric diseases. So here you see that the level of divergence in this gene against the reference genome. So we observe that even between two haplotypes, there's a divergence of 10%. And we can study these high diverse regions only if we can produce complete genomes. And similarly, we also looked in the Kier region, and which has, again, like DL3, DL2, and one subgenes that are also quite highly polymorphic and can be only studied by leveraging new technologies. So the next is, once we have complete genomes, how can we compare these genomes to further unravel the structure variations that is happening across genomes and their functional role? So to solve that problem, we proposed a chromosome scale haplotype resolved pan genomics. So essentially, you can represent multiple genomes in a graph structure where the same sequence across genomes form one node, and all the differences can go in these bubbles. And imagine there is one sample with a repeat of 10 copies, and whereas other sample has a repeat of one copy. And we can encode this whole information in the graph structure, and also discover structure variations and study functional role. And beyond humans, we can also be helpful in breeding, finding two haplotypes to breed, so for improved cultivars. So to construct such a pan genome, so instead of having one pan genome with all the structure variations, we actually uh, developed a hierarchical approach, which is at the multiple res resolutions of variation. So for example, so there is one graph that represents the class level variation, and another graph represents the genus level variation, and another one represents the species level. And then we, we give the connections across these levels based on the same sequences among them. And the, the advantage of this approach is that it is highly flexible and it is highly efficient to the needs of the biologist. However, there's one disadvantage. If we have imagined a sample with like 50% diversity or more than that, that sample will have a limitation at this stage. So, and these tools, they are now being utilized in multiple consortiums within um, uh, US, like Human Pan Genome Project, T2T, and Personal Pan Genome Project, and Genome in a Bottle, and also in Denmark, uh, Danish National Genome Center, and beyond at the European Reference Genome Atlas, so which aims to sequence reference quality genomes for all European species. And beyond research, mentoring is the cornerstone in my career. So since my master's, I have, have a keen interest in integrating uh, computational technology with genomics and pharmacore discovery, so I, which I got a chance to participate in SN Both scholarship program. And then I have furthered this mission by participating in Heidelberg Laureate Forum and organizing multiple workshops 
and courses and scholarship within Nordic region as well as abroad. And I've also participated as a keynote speaker in genomic research and further helped organizing outreach activities beyond Denmark and US. So, so in conclusion, my dedication to DEIA is a personal mission, and I believe the full potential of genetics and genomics can only be unraveled when it is accessible, equitable, and inclusive. And my goal is to re lead a diverse and inclusive research where every voice is heard and every genome is valued. And I, I'm grateful for the funding agencies, including NHRI, and for inviting me and my team members. Thank you. Okay, our second awardee is to the an, is to an NHGRI staff member. Uh, the awardee is Dr. Sherjo Sen, who is an extramural program director at NHGRI and works to create equitable opportunities for students and early career researchers from all backgrounds to have access to education and training in computational genomics and data science. Sherjo has led or co-led the Genomic Data Science Community Network, or GDSCN. It's a project to create a dialogue between NHGRI and faculty at small and diverse institutions. He's also been involved in the educational hub for computational genomics and data science. I talked about it in my director's report, and its associated educational partner sites. His leadership on this has been critical. He's also a training and outreach lead for NHGRI's Anvil Cloud Platform, which is actively being used as a classroom aid at minority-serving institutions. I'd also point out at a personal level, sure, Joe was my postdoctoral fellow in my, my previous life in the intramural research program. So, I, uh, sure, Joe, congratulations. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Less than $10. Oh, uh, that's like $10. Picture, yes, you have to come on. Uh, Even though he's dressed better than me. <laughs> here, here, maybe hold that up. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And it is just, um, it's a very emotional moment to be here receiving an award named after Betty, who um, on both a personal and professional level has been an icon um, since I was a much, much younger man. Let me put it that way. Uh, but I, I want to use my time today to talk about um, things that we do as an institute, uh, not so much my personal work, but work uh, from the Genome Institute. And this is um, a, a vision that we have for using cloud computing as a way of fixing some of the glaring disparities in uh, access to education in genomic data science. So I will start by showing you some numbers. This is from NSF, uh, not NIH. Uh, what you see on the screen is over the decade from 2011 to 2021, some numbers on the STEM workforce uh, as a whole. And I, I'm just gonna let that picture tell its own story, except to point out that while there has been improvement, it's been marginal, and in some cases, such as uh, students with disabilities, there really has been no improvement at all over the last 10 years in terms of uh, how the workforce has become a broader and more inclusive place in STEM. So I think the point of the NSF story, uh, that the article that accompanied this, is that this was just not an acceptable decade in terms of us making any tangible improvements. Genomics, of course, is probably a tiny subsection of uh, STEM as a whole, but uh, I can only guess that the numbers won't be all that different if we were to do this from a genomics perspective. So for today, I bring to you the, the hypothesis that cloud computing, and specifically cloud computing in genomics, is giving us tools to fix uh, that glaring gap. And not just Anvil, which uh, me and Chris Wellington and Valentina and uh, Rob Rowley and others here are lead, the All of Us Researcher Workbench, uh, multiple other NIH cloud platforms. Really, we feel that NIH has put so much data, of course, a big piece of it being genomic data, and so many tools on the cloud that this is high time for us to start using these platforms, not just as research tools or consortium tools, 
but maybe also tools for the classroom, uh, bringing genomic data science to a much broader cross-section of students uh, across the country. And the cloud itself has tremendous um, characteristics that lend it to this, uh, although I won't do my cloud evangelical piece uh, here on this platform today. So with that, uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm really going to talk about two, um, two visions or two, uh, two um, bold hypotheses, if you will. So the first question we ask ourselves is, can we actually use the cloud as an educational tool? It, it hasn't been thought of that way for the most part. Uh, so here, at least at NIH, uh, NHGRI in partnership with ODSS and all of us and others are saying, is it possible for us to take the cloud and use it as something a teacher would use in a classroom rather than a bioinformatician crunching uh, 100,000 genomes uh, for a large consortium? So that's question one. Uh, the other question is, if we build this, if we build educational tools, uh, educational resources on the cloud, is that alone sufficient? Or do we also need to go out and get people to come use this? Uh, I, I do feel personally that it's a little bit of a disconnected uh, viewpoint for us program officers at NIH to say, hey, we built this. This is awesome. You should be using it. Uh, we've learned over the years that it takes a lot of work to connect to the intended users, the students, the faculty members, and say, what can we do to get this into your hands and maybe get some feedback from you on these tools in your classrooms? So really, with this, uh, I'll describe the work we've done to test these, uh, these hypotheses, if you will. The first of these projects, uh, which is about three, three and a half years old at this point, was the Genomic Data Science Community Network. It still is active and ongoing. And what this was is a way for us to hear from the people that we, uh, that we want to reach, the, the faculty member at the small Midwestern community college who maybe teaches biology but has not been uh, teaching genomics and certainly not genomic data science, and say, what has NHGRI, uh, what can NHGRI do to help you bring these topics into your classrooms? So uh, what you see on the screen is, is basically faces, but these are the people that are sitting with the students that I talked about on that uh, graphic at the beginning. And these are the people we want to hear from before we get too deep into this business, because they know the field. We sit in Bethesda area offices, uh, coming to council with proposals, but they actually teach the students. So we designed the Genomic Data Science Community Network to hear from these um, faculty at uh, minority serving institutions. We did do a lot of work to make sure this is spread out across the US. Uh, you'll see on a map there that we have all of the continental US, uh, three locations in Puerto Rico, including one in Hawaii actually. And this is HBCUs, uh, historically black colleges, uh, Hispanic colleges, at least two women's colleges, uh, coupled with community colleges, which are a fascinating world by themselves in terms of education. So I won't, uh, you know, it's a 10 minute talk, so I won't go too, too much into detail, but we heard so much from them that we decided we need to write this up before we get too much further in what has NIGRI yet to uncover in terms of educational opportunities in genomic data science and what could the future hold in terms of new funding announcements. So this is in genome research from, I think, last year or the year before. But it basically summarizes our learning experience hearing from the genomic data science uh, community network members. So with that, uh, you know, this, at the end of the day, GDSCN as it stands was a 100,000-ish dollar contract something that is best thought of as a happy drop in the bucket. Uh, that's the graphic on the left. So really, uh, given the magnitude of the problem, uh, I think we can all converge that one two-year $100,000 contract is uh, not really going to make anything of a tangible long-term difference in this field. So the question then, and some of you on council may remember uh, me coming with a proposal, I think uh, September 2023, if I'm not wrong. But we said, what can we do to really take this into the next five to 10 years to make more of an impact in terms of actual student numbers? Uh, of course, GDSCN is fabulous, so we did put more money into it, uh, increasing the number of partners. But really, the rest of the work which takes this into the five to 10 year time span is a educational hub and partner sites that I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. And ultimately, the objective, uh, if you will, is we hope that when this is done, these small diverse institutions will think of NHGRI and NIH not as something that's an isolated federal office, but as a partner and a supporter for their educational uh, mission for their students and getting them to apply for and receive NHGRI funding to keep doing what they're doing uh, over the long term. 
So anyhow, any good uh, community organization project starts with a good community organizer. Uh, you know, I learned that as a student politician long, long ago on the streets of Calcutta. But uh, we, we started out by putting out a funding opportunity for what we call the hub, which in effect is a community organizer and a facilitator and a coordinator for education using the cloud in genomic data science. This, was a, this is a U24 award uh, after competitive review. Uh, North Carolina Ag and Tech, the nation's largest HBCU, uh, had a fabulous review score. You know, we felt they really would begin from a position of trust, having been in this uh, position that we seek to reach. So we made that award to NCANT about a year ago to begin this hub. They are already engaging with uh, universities and colleges across the nation, telling us what they hear. They're doing train the trainer workshops. We have really, really impressive young faculty member, Dr. Kristen Reinhardt on the left, who uh, is the lead, and Dr. J Joseph Graves on the right is sort of her mentor plus the director of this. So imagine this one central node in the system, which is a large HBCU, which has lived experiences of some of these challenges in teaching genomic data science, being our initial partner uh, for entering this space, after, after of course, GDSCN. But then this is also about the small colleges themselves. Uh, NCANT at the end of the day is a large institution, uh, I think almost at R1 uh, status at this point. So what I will bring to council tomorrow, and uh, that will be another story of its own, is we then said, what can we do to fund the small faculty members like GDSCN members so that they could have protected time, uh, salary, compute money, to create educational content uh, and deliver it in their classrooms. We've learned that these uh, faculty members have tremendous teaching loads, and it's just not fair for us to expect them to teach genomics and data science without uh, giving them some level of financial uh, ability to have protected time for that. So the site's funding announcement, which once again I'll bring a funding plan for tomorrow, is undergraduate and master's students uh, to use the cloud uh, as a virtual lab of sorts for learning genomic data science. There is also money for them to do student projects. We feel that the data analysis is that much more fun when you're analyzing data you created yourself. So that U24 hub I mentioned has six uh, $50,000 pots for the awardees of the sites to design student projects and then the students would collect data, then that goes on the cloud and they all go back and analyze it as a group. So really this we hope will become a community of practice with the hub and these sites awardees four in this cycle hopefully and maybe more later, becoming its own little uh, group that uh, all shares the common mission with us here. So finally, in the last two slides, uh, I've talked faculty, I've talked NHGRI, NIH. What about the students, right? I mean, this is all about the students. So one of the fun things we are trying to do is through GDSCN to extend all of this into something that a student at a small college, usually without a lab and a PCR machine or a sequencer, how can we make these uh, young people part of the genomics research experience? So BioDigs, uh, which is a long acronym up there, is our fun way of doing this. This is with the soil microbiome, uh, not humans, but uh, you know, easier and simpler to get to. So what GDSCN is doing as a way of getting students into the mix is we are shipping out these soil collection kits to small colleges across the nation. A faculty member takes a class of students out and says, hey, let's go do some research, right? So they go, they sample soil at two locations from their campus, one within the built-up environment and one a slightly more rural location uh, somewhere outside campus. And then the students extract the DNA, we, we ship them the supplies, and then that DNA gets sent back to the GDSCN contractor, uh, extracted, sequenced, and then goes on the anvil. And then every Monday we have these fantastic student workshops, and we'll staff working with students from all of these locations where the students are learning how to use the cloud and feeling like they're processing data that comes from the soil they dug up a few weeks ago. So the, the take home message here is that this is not just about funding announcements and faculty applying and receiving grants. We are also making this something that the students can have fun with and come to genomics, uh, you know, hopefully to stay there after they finish their undergraduate degrees. So with that, I'll end. Uh, I hope I gave you a sense of what our long-term vision is. This is as much about community engagement as about science and uh, computational topics. Uh, this is about using the cloud as a teaching tool, and we'll see where we go with that in five years, uh, what other lessons we learn. And as I said at the end of this, we hope that these institutions will feel that NIH is a partner and, uh, and a friend of them 
rather than something that uh, is only on the news when pandemics come about and uh, you know politicians fight. So with that, I will end uh, thanking a whole lot of people. And of course, you know, Betty, at every stage of this, uh, you've been an inspiration. Thank you. There's Nikki. Great. Uh, by the way, what you're going to see is um, from you saw from the first two speakers, and I'm sure you'll hear from the third, um, one common personality characteristic, incredible enthusiasm in all of our awardees, which I think is characteristic of the kind of enthusiasm that, and dedication that Betty brought to everything she did in this area as well. Well, our final awardee is the Established Extramural Investigator Awardee. And this goes to Dr. Nikki Mulder. And, uh, and Nikki heads the Computational Biology Division at the University of Cape Town. She is passionate about capacity development and making bioinformatics and genomic medicine accessible to all African scientists. As a mentor, she focuses on developing early career scientists and emphasizing women. She has been a mentor for two mid-career female scientists. But meanwhile, under her leadership, the H3 BioNet network has trained over 4,500 individuals across Africa in topics across the genomics and bioinformatics spectrum. The training program that she was involved in designing served to ensure access by diverse groups across low and middle income countries and has reached underrepresented groups in over 18 countries. The upskilling of African scientists is helping to ensure equity and their position on the global genomics scale. And so I want to uh, congratulate uh, Nikki. Um, you would think, of course, she's from South Africa. You would think that she's zooming in from South Africa, but I guess I understand she's actually zooming in from New York City, where she had another commitment. But she is able to join us by Zoom. And we will get this to you somehow, Nikki, but this is a nice, put it up by her. Oh, no. Oh, you want me to stand there? Oh, you're going to get a picture of that? Or? Oh, there you go. Oh, I got to do it this way. Oh, this is really complicated. <laughs> Like that. There you go. <laughs> Look this way. <laughs> Mickey, you got to put your hand out towards us. This. this is going to be complicated. Just do this. There you go. <laughs> this is called low budget AI. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> So, Nikki, I'll let you take it over. There we go. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you very much for um, this honor. And um, I'm very sorry I can't be there. At least I'm closer. I'm in New York for a meeting. But um, I would love to have been there. So, I'm going to talk about enhancing uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, particularly from the African experience. So, I'm going to talk about um, each of these individually, sometimes in terms of um, access or diversity or equity in participation um, or in data or in training. But actually, all of these are very interlinked because um, the data, the, the training, you know, we have um, some of the, the diversity includes um, elements of equity and accessibility. So it all started through H3 Africa, which, of course, is um, one of the babies of the um, NIH, uh, funded through the Common Fund. And H3 Africa had this vision to facilitate African-based research, and it had a very strong component of capacity building. And one of those components um, of the H3 Africa program, one of the funded uh, projects, was H3 Bionet, which is the network that I led. And that was really to build bioinformatics capacity to enable genomics research on the continent. So... In terms of the diversity, H3 Bionet has a lot of diversity in terms of um, geographic, so participation from many, many different countries. So we had 17 different countries, one um, being the US, but 16 African countries represented, and at one stage, more than 32 institutions. We also have very good uh, demographic diversity, good representation um, of females, but also across different career levels. So from really from the um, graduate level all the way to, to professors, data analysts, um, et cetera. And then diversity and expertise, because bioinformatics is extremely diverse. Genomics is extremely diverse. Um, and so we have expertise across the, the scale of uh, from biology all the way to highly technical IT. 
And then Asia Africa, and I'm bringing this in because we one of the things we did is is really increase diversity, um, is access to this diversity in data. So Asia Africa included uh, participants from about 34 different countries, and we all know how underrepresented African data um, have been in the public repositories. And you can see from the past to to now the the, the blue line being non-African and then the brown African. How we've increased, managed to increase the diversity and the accessibility of data um, coming from African populations. So diversity in our workforce, we have um, diversity in all aspects from the audience, from um, we train trainers, from different bioinformatics users to scientists, to clinicians, to IT people. We really had to train this really broad spectrum of genomics, of the genomics workforce. And we used a number of different modalities from in-person to um, online training to hackathons to jamborees to internships and really trying different approaches to to reach these different um, audience types so the audience types um, as i said from from bioinformatics users all the way to to the technical people and this meant a very um, kind of large diversity in the number of different topics so yes it was all about genomics but gen genomics is all you have to set up the infrastructure you have to build the workflows you have different as different workflows in, in this and then you also need to interpret the data in terms of ac access to um, to data capacity, this is really where equity comes in. So apart from the fantastic uh, funding that we've received from Asia Africa to, and um, that's Wellcome Trust and NIH to, to build genomics uh, data infrastructure and, and research infrastructure, really there's very little on the continent and there was very little when we started. And you can't be equitable, you can't have an, equ an equal sort of stage in the international genomics arena if you don't have access to the data generation and the data infrastructure to analyze and interpret the data. So initially, by it, we actually had to start from scratch in many African countries, building every one of these pieces, um, because every one of these has been a challenge in, in resource limited settings. And then, of course, there's the training that goes associated, that's associated with every one of these. It's, you know, yes, the whole course just to discuss data capture and uh, cleaning, for example. And so really our focus here was empowering African scientists to take ownership of their data so that they could uh, analyze, interpret, um, and publish on their own data and be the leading authors in those publications. We also looked at uh, equitable collaboration and partnerships. So partners uh, had complementary areas of expertise so that they weren't competing with each other. They were really working together and had respect no matter whether they were working with a student or whether they were working with a senior professor. Um, and we also tried to build capacity in our individual institutions, those 32 institutions, to enable them to contribute equitably. So when we started, um, for many of them, we did an assessment of whether they are full associate or development nodes, depending on how much they could contribute in the bioinformatics space. By the end of the project over a decade, most of those moved to either full nodes or um, associate nodes, so really could contribute uh, to bioinformatics. And then inclusion, we um, focus quite a lot on the, the development of the next generation of bioinformatics leaders. So we actually watched over this decade, people go from PhD positions to postdocs, to junior academics and to independent academics. Some went on to prestigious institutions, EBI, Paul and Melinda Gates Foundation, they won uh, prestigious awards, fellowships, the Welcome Fellowships, which are extremely competitive. And so we tried to do this through uh, giving our young researchers access to uh, leadership op opportunities and working groups and projects, and thereby enabling them to learn how to manage projects, how to lead their own projects and network with other people. And we particularly focused on, on women scientists, and many of our, our project leads were, were females, and um, we, some of us are ambassadors for the WIDS, the Women in Data Science. We try to include um, uh, a diverse group in terms of training. So we have a train the trainer program because we, we know that this is about uh, this is what you need for sustainability, but also to build their own careers in an academic uh, scenario. And so we uh, built up a set of, of trainers across the continent. And trainees, we also try to be as inclusive as possible. The training was focused on, on Africa, but really we reached people um, in, in other places as well through our face-to-face -face and online. The US ones were often participants, for example, in hackathons, but you can see that we reach um, quite a lot of different countries, even outside of the continent. We reached about 23 different countries, in fact, and most of them from underrepresented groups. 
In terms of access, um, we've been trying to make sure that this amazingly diverse, um, underrepresented set of Asia Africa data are accessible by submission to public repositories and making those findable in the Asia Africa catalog. So we have the, um, the global community can uh, search and request access to this data. Uh, we map these to ontologies and we put information about um, access requirements so that it's much more accessible. In terms of other accessibility, so we, we try to convert the information that's, that's in public repositories into something that's relevant. So we, we identify all the African um, microbiome projects, put them in a portal, uh, African genomic medicine, anything that's clinically actionable that's really relevant to what's discovered in African populations, and then African genome variation database to show frequencies at a more fine-grained level than a NOMAD does, because we know that clinically actionable variants are actually um, differs quite significantly across the continent in terms of their frequencies. We've increased the access to training through this distributed classroom model that was started several years ago. And through our introduction to bioinformatics course, this really became a flagship project. And this is, um, I won't go into the details about how this works, but really it, it allows you to have classrooms across the continent that join together for three months of the year. And uh, this last iteration and, uh, that started a few weeks ago, we've got 1,600 participants. And so this allows us to provide accessibility at scale, even in the absence of the internet. So some people go and they download the videos, they watch them, and then they join online. We have WhatsApp groups in case people have internet issues. So this course has been um, really quite um, impactful. We have, um, over, as I said now, over 1,600 participants, over 50 different classrooms this time, and you can see from the map that we again reach many, many different African countries. We try to increase access to the training materials, even for those, because even with those 1,600, we have another 2,000 waiting in the wings that wanted to attend the course, actually more. Um, and so we transcribe the training materials. We make these the training materials fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And we try and uh, translate, transcribe these into English subtitles, and then where possible, translate into other languages. So these courses, uh, these course materials, have been accessed up to fifteen thousand times. And then um, for ongoing support for the genomics workforce, we know that when people leave and they um, want to have questions after the course. They, they really struggle to have access, particularly in, in African institutions where they don't have a mentor or a supervisor who has expertise in bioinformatics or genomics. So we've created this database where a trainer can register and give the area of expertise, and then trainees can um, raise a ticket and then get assigned a, a kind of like a mentor to answer their questions. So finally, the, the impact of our training, we've trained, it's in fact now more than 5,000. In fact, I've heard now it's even more than about, um, it, it's way more than that over the, over the last uh, decade. 90% of these have shared their, their experience with their training materials with others. 30% have, of, of have said the trainings enabled their degrees. 33% enabled publications. And for others that have promoted collaborations. So um, we also have anecdotal um, impact stories, you know, for example, like this, it just makes everything so rewarding. Without you, I'd still be far from the field of bioinformatics. Um, and we have many cases like this where we are H3 Abinet trainees from outside H3 Abinet and H3 Africa too um, have said how we've made a difference. We also have other outputs. So we provide training guides. We've actually developed a, a guide for how to build, infra build bioinformatics infrastructure from scratch in, in omics and many other uh, documents, which are all openly accessible. Everything we do is openly accessible. So this has all been made possible through funding from the NIH uh, Common Fund. And um, I'd like to acknowledge just the entire team. This was a I mean, very much a group effort. Um, and so if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you. OK, so we're going to now have a panel discussion. If I could ask our two awardees who are present to come sit here, maybe I'll grab your seat. And we'll leave Nikki up on the big screen behind us. That'll be perfect. OK, so I have a few questions, but I also really would welcome council members or others in the audience to feel free to jump in. Um, I guess one of the things that we always like to illustrate is, is you know, each of you clearly has um, diversity, inclusion, equity, accessibility issues baked into your soul. 
in many ways, but there, I'd be curious when that sort of was something, whether there was a, a single moment in your career or whether there was an individual or a circumstance or whether that was just always second nature to you. So I guess I, we just we would like to hear from each of you if there was sort of your memory of when that just sort of became a priority. Maybe we'll start here. That's a great question. Um, actually, it's in the Indian culture, it's very diverse. And as a child, you are encouraged to appreciate the diversity. And then I, I'm trained as a computer scientist. And being under this SN Bose scholarship program, which is a collaboration between India and US, that really ignited this moment of appreciating the genomic diversity. And there are different challenges across globe, like um, some are ethical challenges, like um, in India or you, uh, in Europe, you, it's harder to get your um, blood sample sequenced, and there are either a lack of infrastructure, but there are also many opportunities. There's, there's a great thrive in young scientists to go beyond and unravel and study the full genome. So it's really the internship opportunity under the SN Bose program that ignited the spirit to appreciate the genomic diversity. And that continued until now. And I hope to contribute um, many more decades to come. So, so it illustrates that these programs can have catalytic effects. So that's actually a part. Sure, Joe? Yeah, Eric, that's a, that's a thought-provoking question. And Shilpa, that's a great answer, too. I guess my story would come out of paradoxes. Uh, maybe like Shilpa, I spent a lot of my early childhood in India in fairly resource-limited institutions, but in a personal context, coming from a place of not extreme privilege, but you know, not lacking anything on the personal front, but then going to college and 80 of us did a DNA extraction together, one sample. So there was just enough reagents for a class of 80 to do one extraction. I, I got to touch the vortex machine, you know, that, that sticks in my mind. So there's this paradox of, uh, you know, not lacking anything in a personal sense, but going to educational places where there really was no way of learning genomics. Uh, fast forward a few years, you know, I came come to the U.S. I, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I went to LSU, uh, Louisiana State, for my PhD. But it, it was a place where the grad student next to us in the lab, next to mine, you know, we got her free, if we wrote to the companies, they sent us free samples of enzymes. And that's how she did some of her graduate work. And then from there, I came to your lab. You know, so once again, that was a wake-up moment of LSU versus NHGRI intramural program within the same country. So I think these, um, as I grow older, these realizations that privilege and the lack of privilege coexist within the same societies, uh, that underlies some of my work. Nikki, how would, what, what are your thoughts about my question? Uh, quite similar, actually. So I, after my PhD, I went to work at the European Bioinformatics Institute for nearly nine years. And when I came back, um, it, I was acutely aware of, of the, the difference in infrastructure, but I was so impressed by how much African scientists do with so little. Um, and I thought that's something that's got to be promoted. And when I, you know, when we have training courses now and I hear about the lens that people go to, to, to get this training, to access this, um, you know, we have stories of people who drive kilometers and then get on a, somebody I was actually talking about rowing a boat across the river to get to a place where they could join one of our courses. And then you think it's got to be worth it. Um, and the personal stories we hear about what an impact it's made um, certainly make it worth it. But it's really about seeing how people just do so much with so little uh, because that's, you know, that's all they have access to. Um, and so if we can give them a little bit more, uh, that's the most rewarding thing I think that we could possibly have. So, so Nikki, I'm going to ask the next question. We'll go in reverse order. So I'm going to start with you. I'm going to ask the magic wand question. So if I handed you a magic wand and there's one thing you could wish for and immediately implement that would have a seismic impact on improving the diversity of the genomics workforce, what would it be? How would oh, well. you use your magic wand? Um, well, there's always more money. 
it's it, i think it's 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 having um the ability to 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 access more people so we have um such a demand and that demand is never going away uh, so if we can if we can get more trainers if we can get more mentors i think more mentors and that can be globally uh, that are willing to come in. It doesn't have to be a lot of time that you devote, but if you can come in, find somebody or a group of people that you could mentor, um, I think that would that would be be useful. But you know, something we need to think about uh, innovative ways of making this um, sustainable and expandable to really reach this enormous demand. Sergio. Yeah, I have a simple answer for that one. I get travel funds. Uh, you know, with this uh, the sort of work that. I described, and maybe Nikki, you've um, you've encountered similar situations. I, I think these things really get off the ground well when you get people together in a room, the students, the trainers, the faculty. And one of the things we get disproportionately good impact out of is the one or two meetings a year where the students from these places come spend time with us, uh, with Johns Hopkins, the GDSCN contractor. So my best guess is that if we had more money to get people in the same space taking in-person trainings or attending conferences when they had never had a chance before, that might be the catalytic piece uh, to get things moving faster. Shobha. Yes, I'm with Shobha and Nick as well. Like we need a global community effort and, and initiatives so that people from diverse background like um, disciplines like data science, bi bioinformatics, but also society, considering people with different mindsets, like I think bringing these people together and giving them a platform to succeed, to innovate, I think that could be, that could facilitate some more opportunities in this area. So I, I know that each of you spend time talking to trainees and they always ask for advice. Um, and but so I'm curious, but what's your sort of immediate go to advice you give young people? And they say, what do I do to be successful? But also you probably don't as, have much as an opportunity, but now you do have the opportunity. What, what, what would you what would you um, recommend mentors do to be better at their efforts to diversify the workforce? So what's your advice to trainees? What's your advice to mentors? So the trainees be curious and be creative. Don't follow always what, like what has been always just the state of the art. Be be innovative, be creative, and but also learning from past experiences of like experienced researchers in the field. Um, Mentors. Um, appreciate the new ideas from coming from young minds, <laughs> uh, and also. So don't um, stifle innovation, or because just because it's a very junior person, right? <laughs> um, and just work along with them, like appreciating and um, working along. Uh, yeah. Georgia. Yeah. Well, Eric, I have a funny story to tell. It involves you. Uh -oh. So this is. The <laughs> this is where we go off script. <laughs> well, just a little bit, just a little bit. So this, this is that I'll I'll tackle the training piece first. Uh, you know, my mind goes back to. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, wrapping up my PhD, deciding on postdocs. Your lab website at the time, and you have no reason to remember this, uh, had a line on it saying the lab is full, we are not accepting new trainees. And I looked at it as, nah, I'm just gonna write to him anyhow. Like, uh, I, I don't know why, so my advice mentoring her is, I just took a leap of faith and I emailed you at two, I'm a late night person, you, you, you probably remember that. And within minutes, I swear, minutes, I don't know whether you were some, you're usually not awake at 2 a.m., I know that, so you, maybe you were traveling. But at like 2 or 3 or something, I probably still have that email. I get a message back from you saying that website is out of date, I am accepting students, <laughs> come do an interview. So early on, for anyone early in their career, my biggest message is to not overthink things, you know, not be constrained by personal confidence or anxiety issues, and just go for it, grab it. It's important at any stage, but particularly important early on. Uh, mentors, uh, you know, having been an international mentee myself, and then now later on in my career mentoring people, I guess the big thing I would point out is mental health. Um, in, in, it's particularly been a crazy few years, so both as a mentee and a mentor, I think um, I'm learning the importance of not taking anyone's mental health for granted and just being uh, aware that someone may have a lot going on 
even though they don't show it uh, when they're talking to me as a scientist. Nikki? So for uh, trainees, I would say confidence. So be confident in, confident in your own skills and your own ideas. Um, and um, you know, always respect others in, in, and listen to others. Um, but fundamentally, it's all about good science. So you can be a very nice person, but you've got to be a good scientist. Um, and so maintain excellence in science. For mentors, I would say, um, so when I mentor people, it's more about the other things, not the science. So it's more about how you deal with people. How do you do a good job if you're on a scientific advisory board? How do you, you know, all, all the other things around academia um, and give them your life experience. Because actually, even if you had a bad experience, that's a lesson learned. So you're a mentor because you, you're giving them your experiences. Um, so give them the best, uh, best of uh, the, what you did right, but it's also, also what you did wrong. Okay, this is my last question, and then we'll open it up. But and I'm going to start with Nikki because it's a hard question. So I'm going to start with the, the, the most experienced individual of the awardees. So here you have a chance. The NHGRI director, along with his advisory council, are all ears. And we want to know what can NHGRI do additionally to push forward an agenda to improve the diversity, equity, and inclusion in the genomics workforce? What, what's, what, what are we not doing that you wish we were doing? I think it's about um, sustainability. So we have, and it's just something that's difficult for funding agents to do because you, you have grants for a very finite period and there's always what happens after that and there's always a you know request for sustainability and you can build people, but you, know, you need to have somewhere for them to go. So I think um, sustainable training programs are longer duration, but then also having somewhere for people to go. So particularly in Elmix where there aren't, institutions can't just create posts for new people. So look at these new disciplines in genomics, in data science, in bioinformatics, and say, can we put some um, um, positions in at the sort of mid, mid uh, to late career so that we actually have somewhere for these people to go. Otherwise, we end up with brain drain. So we can train a genomics force and workforce and lose them. We've got to have something in innovative and exciting somewhere for them to go. So I think it's about long-term sustainability, but also uh, creating positions for them where the institution is not able to do so. Sure, Joe. Yeah, well, Eric, I feel that question, you know, I, I'd I'm not senior leadership, but I feel I'm almost on both sides of that question, so I'll try to answer it from that perspective. As you and uh, Jian and others have made it so clear, money is tight and it's not going to get better anytime quicker. So I guess the one thing that could be done is to connect us, program officers, um, you know, people at my stage of their careers, with other sources of money. I mean, we did this with the public-private partnership thing in your office um, a few weeks ago. Maybe NSF, if NIH money is tight, we just got to go find money somewhere else is my viewpoint. And uh, it, as it stands, that takes ethics, paperwork, and legal agreements. So maybe just helping us create uh, inroads into sources that have money, whether they come from within government or outside. Um, I would say more support for young investigators. I know there's already has some initiatives, but also like when I wrote my K99, like I, that was my first grant and I was seeking like training support, encouragement. I was fortunate to get it from the mentors, but that's not always available. So I think more programs uh, for young uh, researchers to encourage them applying for like global initiatives. Okay, I'm going to open this up either to any member of council, either in the room or on the Zoom or in the Zoom room or even any staff members. Any questions for any of our awardees or any comments? Yeah, Casey. Thanks so much for the uh, presentation. So I actually had a question for uh, Sergio and, and Nikki around this uh, model of train the trainer. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about how that works in practice and how, how like what, uh, what kind of evidence have you seen in this being like an effective strategy to, to reach more and more people? Nikki, would you like to go first or I can take that one, whatever works for you. 
Uh, sure. I'll, I'll um, quickly talk about our experience. So we've done train the train in two ways. One is we start with training and then those people in our next course become teaching assistants. On the next course, they potentially become trainers. The other is more formal where we actually do training We in, in um, the theory of teaching, how you develop courses, how you develop competencies and curricula. And then we give those people opportunities. So last year we ran this along with an, um, our remote classroom model. And now this year, those trainers are actually taking on regional training, our regional classrooms. So we not only train them in the theory, but then we give them the opportunities to, be, to go to the next level um, and, and watch them as they then become bona fide trainers and then go out on their own and do, do their own training. So we're trying to monitor them and make sure that they run their own training courses um, in in uh, in time, so it's it's formal, but it's also informal by you know giving different opportunities at different stages. Yeah, and what I would add to that is um, particularly in this place of genomic data science, train the trainer works when we find someone that is not intimidated by the data science piece. It's much more common to find a teaching faculty member who has taught some genomics. It's that much less likely to find someone that has taught genomics and maybe even basic programming of some sort. So we try to create things which are not intimidating for the new data science people. And there is a personality aspect to it. Uh, you train the trainer works really well when the initial person getting trained has, a, how to put it, a certain personality type that just works better when they go back and they're doing their version of the training. So something where we have learned that uh, a classroom works well when we attract the right sort of initial person. They go back and they start attracting more people. Um, it's a little bit of a labor intensive process, but when it works, it's a thing of beauty. Thank you. Carl? So I think um, you know, one of the ways we can get to having um, you know, a more diverse workforce in genomics is for more people to take on the task of being mentors to bring people into the field. So um, you know, I'm probably one among many people who don't have enough experience with how to do that well. So just any advice or thoughts about how, you know, uh, how to be a good mentor for trainees who are from backgrounds that are underrepresented in genomics? So maybe starting with organizing some workshops and webinars like to, and seeing from their perspective uh, what examples can really motivate them. And then slowly, um, like for example, we have in Arga, we have, we brought together people from East, Asia, East Europe and also some of the um, like minority groups from India. And then their challenges are quite different. So we did some pre-surveys and webinars for first locally to gather some information what 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 really drives them. And then then we did more like a common platform to bring people together. Yeah, Kyle, that's a really good question. My mind goes back to the many mentors I've had over the years uh, in different places. So I think what I try to use as a mentor myself these days, mainly to program analysts within the extramural program, but also back when I was in Eric's lab uh, mentoring summer students through SIP, is that each mentee is coming out of a unique set of not just their personal abilities, but also life experiences. My mind goes back to a young woman who subsequently went on to be a Rhodes Scholar, is now an MD, PhD student at MIT, like success all over her, right? But then in a different way of looking at it, she had everything. She was an extreme hard worker, so I'm not taking any one thing away from her. But it was almost like her lived experiences were putting her on the fast track to success. And then I've had other mentees with whom I've been aggravated or frustrated, only to realize that I didn't realize they were working a second job after they went home from the lab, right? So just, you know, each mentee being different is uh, what I've learned over the years. Wait, I, I'm going to go. Nikki, anything you want to add? Yeah, very quickly, just to say that uh, I found it quite easy to get people excited. Maybe it's my enthusiasm about genomics is infectious, but 
you tell them about the, the amazing opportunities, what, what genomics can do. So I've got mathematicians, computer scientists, and they get so excited because the data matters. It matters to health, it matters to, to many other applications, and, and that's what gets them excited. We're going to go to Bruce and then Judy. Bruce? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations, first of all, all of the awardees. Um, really inspiring presentations. I was impressed with the um, the concept of using public data sets, and I guess in particular, I'll single out all of us um, in this context. And I wonder if it's possible in some way to connect the trainees with the actual participants um, in community engagement activities. I think it would be inspirational to the trainees to see the people who really have the, the issues that are under study and frankly would be equally inspirational to people to realize the way their data are being used and who knows in the long run it could even have grassroots effects that might counteract some of the political challenges in terms of funding. Eric, maybe I can take that one. Yeah, no, Bruce, that's, uh, that's absolutely on the money. I mean, it's uh, not a coincidence and probably a little bit of a coincidence, but the U24 hub that I mentioned, uh, the, the community organizer, so the PI for that award is also extensively involved in all of us as uh, one of their campus champions. Uh, I, I mean, there are so many intersections between what we are doing through the Genome Institute and what all of us is doing. There are awardees in common. There are students coming out of these training programs that in some cases are already participants in all of us. So I don't know, Eric, whether this um, trickles from the organic fact that NHGRI and all of us work closely together, or whether it's a coincidence that both of them have cloud platforms and it's more of a cloud intersection thing than a IC leadership intersection thing. But uh, Bruce, I'm happy to give you more details, but a lot of this work is right at that intersection of the Genome Institute and what all of us is doing. I mean, I was a keynote speaker at their spring engagement meeting, which speaks to the fact that, you know, they, they know that what we do is involving their students and their faculty members anyhow. Thank you. You want to add Shopa? Sure. So uh, I will add an example from Personal Genome Project, where, which actually has a cons very open consent form that you that the participants could be contacted back at any time. I think having initiatives and in, um, projects where there is more like open consent opportunity, I think could facilitate this interaction between students or professors with the participants. Nikki, anything to add? Oh, I just think it's a wonderful idea. It's really important for the data scientists and the mathematicians to really understand the participants whose data they're dealing with and, and vice versa. Okay, Judy, I think we're going to give you the last question. Yeah, a couple of you come from computer science backgrounds, and so artificial intelligence. If you read economics uh, literature, it's all over the map in terms of what implications AI has for workforce. So can you put your futuristic hats on and kind of anticipate from the genomics lens, how, how AI is gonna modulate the workforce and training? I'm positive that it will make workforce more creative, that <laughs> like the code that we are just, if it's like repetitive, that can be easily done by AI at this point, but more creativity in genomics could be facilitated by, I think, um, AI. So I'm positive. We didn't expect anything other than optimism. <laughs> Judy, just to make sure I have the question right, are you asking about the workforce and getting them up to speed with AI as it takes off, or are you asking how AI could be used as a tool in this work that we do? And both of them are probably cyclical to some extent. Or does it, I think you were getting it as a threat. Well, I wasn't getting at a threatened thing. I, how's, you know, just a future, how is it going to shape? How are we going to shape the future? Because what I don't like a yeah. lot about the economics AI literature is like how it's going like, to get rid of jobs. Yeah. And so I do like the creative <laughs> answer. That's <laughs> hopeful. Um, but how do you train the future workforce? Because we think it's yeah. going to be monolithic. <laughs> Well, you know, Eric co-chairs, and I'm one of the coordinators for the Bridge to AI program that was also part of the director's report. So part of the thing we have there, to cut a long story short, Bridge to AI has at least one third of its mission focused on training a new generation, like workforce development. 
and AI could steal postdoc jobs unless the postdocs themselves know how to use AI, right? So we, we have, a, I could do like a five minute talk if I bring my laptop back here. But there is training in genomic AI happening through Bridge to AI, Common Fund Money OT2 awards, so that genomics postdocs of the future are not viewing AI as something that's a mathematician, statistician field. And that way we hope that the risk gets lessened of a computational entity taking over the job that uh, right now a human would have in terms of interpreting genomic data. So I think that AI, we, one of the things we're discussing here in New York in the Biomedics Education Summit is, is how does AI fit into training. Um, I think AI in the future is going to um, free us up for other things. So AI is not ready to be to take over many things yet. There's a, there are a lot of um, issues with AI, but it is going to help us to, instead of having to do all those menial tasks of writing code from scratch, it's going to be about checking, critically evaluating what comes out of it. Uh, you need a real human mind. You need somebody who has context information to do that. Uh, but it will free us up to do other things, um, other things in science, um, and uh, and not have to do all the menial tasks of uh, that AI could do. Since you're yep. talking about DEI, I think the challenge is to avoid algorithmic biases as we implement AI in these mm. different scenarios. Mm. Good point. OK, we are done. Um, uh, Rudy, I'm assuming we're about to take a 15-minute break, so I can do it. But we're going to keep the awardees stay here. Nikki, do not leave. We want to get a group photo, even though we're going to bring you in by screen for that photo. Um, but everybody else gets a break, and, and we will reconvene at 3.15, 3.15. And, and council members can just turn your camera off. <laughs>